Would you all open your hymns to 454, Softly and Tenderly, Jesus is Calling, and we'll stay seated for this. My brothers and I would like to welcome you here this morning to the house of the Lord. That's right, Jesus is calling us and calling us to come home. And that's what we need to be doing. And we're going to have that opportunity in the new year coming up to refresh and to redo and to reset our lives to where we actually put Christ first and build his kingdom. If you all join with me, I'm going to, uh, the, the uh, call to worship this morning is out of 2 Nephi. 13, chapter 13, 19 through 32. If you'd like to follow along with me, you're more than welcome to. And I heard a voice from the Father saying, The words of my beloved are true and faithful. He that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. Now, my beloved brethren, I know by this that unless a man shall endure to the end, in following the example of the Son of the living God, he cannot be saved. Wherefore, do the things which I have told you. I have seen that your Lord and your Redeemer should do. For, for, for this cause have they been shown to me, that ye might know the gate by which ye should enter. For the gate by which you should enter is repentance 
and baptism of the water and then comes as a remission of the sins by fire and by the Holy Ghost. Then are you in the straight and narrow path which leads to eternal life. You have entered in by the gate. You have done according to the commandments of the Father and of the Son and you have received the Holy, the Holy Ghost which witnesses to the Father and the Son to the fulfilling of thy promise, which he hath made that if you enter in by the way, you should receive. Now, my beloved brethren, after you have gotten into the straight and narrow path, I would ask if all is done. Behold, I say to you, no, for you have not come thus far, save it whereby the words of Christ with unshaken faith in him, relying wholly upon the merits of him who is mighty to save. Wherefore, ye must press forward with a steadfast in Christ, having a perfect brightness of hope and love of God in all men. Wherefore, if ye shall press forward, feasting upon the words of Christ and endure to the end, behold, thus saith the Father, ye shall have eternal life. Now behold, my beloved brethren, this is the way. There is no other way nor name under heaven whereby man can be saved in the kingdom of God. Behold, this is the doctrine of Christ and the only and true doctrine of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, which is one God without end. Amen. May God bless the reading of his word. Would you all, for the opening hymn we're going to sing, was it to behold the Savior at our door, 449, and we'll stand for this, and our high priest, Eddie Gates, will give the invocation. Continue our prayer, O Lord, unto thee, giving thee thanks and praise, most high, for truly thou art worthy of our praise. We invoke thy spirit now, O God, that he may walk amongst us, that his presence may be known amongst us, that we shall worship thee in truth and in spirit. That all is said 
and done even according to thy will and may be pleasing unto thee that we may be drawn closer even into thy bosom as we have come here to worship thee this day is our prayer in Jesus name amen Matthew 22, 36 through 39. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. When questioned, Jesus gave the answer that there are two great commandments, love God and love thy neighbor as thyself. At the end of the day, any explanation of the law centers around these two laws. Jesus said, on these two commandments hang the laws and the prophets. Everything that has ever been given from heaven centers around the following these two commandments. These complete the law. So it's very important that we uh, keep make this a uh, high priority in our life. Putting God first by following the two greatest commandments. Love God and love thy neighbor. By doing this, this all, puts all the other commandments into place. It's hard work, but rewarding in the end. It comes back to that scripture, Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So what would we, so what would we do without the Lord? Brothers and sisters, I'd like to read for you from the third proverb some words that uh, I think are appropriate at this time. It says, Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thy increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. Brethren, please come forward. As those words were written that I've just read, we should consider this a, an opportunity, not a burden, not something that uh, should be hard for us to do. And we should be able to do it with uh, gratitude in our heart and with some joy in our heart that if we reflect upon the way that our offerings are supposed to take place, it should take place on what we have to give and, and a surplus of what we have to give. Um, the Lord doesn't expect us to give something that we don't have. He doesn't expect us to give more than we're capable of giving. But even if we don't have money, we have time and we have talents that we can offer to the Lord. So no matter what state we're in, we always have something that we can offer to the Lord. And to me, that is a blessing. If we count our blessings, that, that uh, we have more than we need. We have more energy than we need. We have more health than we need. We have more monies or whatever it is. We have something we can offer to the Lord. So please, as we make this offering, do it in joy in your heart, recognizing that the Lord has blessed you with more than what you actually really need. Would you pray with me, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you at this time, and once again, we're so grateful for the many blessings you've given us. If we stop for just a moment and reflect upon how good you are to us and how merciful you are towards us and how you extend your arm to us in such long suffering, uh, knowing that we are imperfect and knowing that we fall way short of what you've designed us to be, yet we still realize that you love us you care for us and you continually take care of us Lord we would ask that as we make our offerings this day that it would come up to you as a sweet smelling savor that it would be pleasing in your sight that you might look upon us as your children 
that you have great love for and compassion for, that we might be the apple of your eye. We would ask these things, Lord, and that all these monies and gifts and offerings would be watched over and guided and directed by you, that these monies and talents would be well spent. And these things we ask in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Good morning, brothers and sisters. As a, uh, as a setting for what we're going to, going to talk about this morning, I want to read to you a, a poem uh, that was taken from a wall in an orphanage in Calcutta, uh, far removed from either ourselves or awareness or a limelight where people gave their life in service to their fellow men. Here's how it reads. People are often unreasonable, irrational, and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you are kind, people may accuse you of selfish, ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you are successful, you will win some false friends and some true enemies. Succeed anyway. If you are honest and sincere, people may deceive you. Be honest and sincere anyway. What you spend years building, someone could destroy overnight. Build anyway. The good that you do today, people will often forget tomorrow. Do good anyway. Give the best that you have, and it may never be enough. Give your best anyway. You see, in the final analysis, it is between you and your God. It was never between you and them anyway. Let's all open our hymns to 410, open my eyes that I may see, and we'll be stay seated for this. Yeah. 
We now come to a, a time of year when many of us take opportunity to, to look backward at the preceding year, to the, the things that we've been able to accomplish, the things that we've been able to do. We also look forward to the year to come to the things that we hope to accomplish, the things that we hope to make better in our lives. We make resolutions. We commit ourselves to, to greater work, to continued improvement, and to bettering the way that the way that we represent our Savior and our Redeemer and our friend in our lives. And I think the scripture that we started out this morning encapsulates what I, what I think about um, this time of year and what I think about what is before us very well. When we were asked if all was done, if, if we had done everything that needed to be done, or if there was something more to go, the answer was, behold, I say unto you, nay. For as long as we are alive and breathing and upright on this earth, there is further work to do as we press toward the high calling. That we find and see in the life of Jesus Christ. As we commit ourselves to the work that has been given to us as a church. the bringing to pass and the preparing of a people and a city of the kingdom of God here on this earth. As we look forward to those things, as we look backward on the year before us, how do we feel about how far we have come? As we look forward to the year, year to come, what do we expect? What do we hope for? And what can we do better in our walk and in our path to endure to the end? To answer the door when Jesus knocks in our lives and to let our life be no longer our own, but a reflection of his. Because in the end, brothers and sisters, uh, we, we say it a lot of ways when we talk about uh, the condition that we need to be in our lives and that our church needs to be as a whole the spiritual condition required. The Doctrine and Covenants talks about us being in a, in a place in our lives and in our lives together that the places that we occupy, this building, will shine as Zion, will shine as the city is set on a hill, will shine as a light to all those around us. And getting there is something that's easy to say, but not as often easy to, to implement in our lives. Because in short, brothers and sisters, we have to look to our example. We have to look to the author and finisher of our faith. We have to look to the one who before time was and before we 
took our first steps, looked upon us in our lives and said, I will come save them. We have to take his life into our own and let it be our guide. Let it no longer be us living and walking and interacting with others, but be him through us. Paul uh, described it very well, I think, in uh, the book of Galatians. He described it very well because I think he was able to talk about something that had happened to him in his life. The second chapter in the 20th verse, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In short, brothers and sisters, we have to give over the reins and invite Christ not just into our hearts, but in control of them. That, that the witness that we bear, that the way that we talk to people, that the way that we interact with our brothers and sisters in the church, with our brothers and sisters in the world, the way that we carry ourselves and the love that we have. is then not a reflection of ourselves and our opinions, but is a reflection of the love that Christ had for us when he gave himself for us. And I want to talk about a little bit about that this morning, about the love and the grace, and the forgiveness the way that, that we need to live out the testimony of Jesus Christ in our lives, in our, the, in our lives with our brothers and sisters in the church, and as we stand before the world. Because for our homes, for our lives, or the church buildings that we occupy to shine as Zion those same lives have to, to shine with the light and the love of Jesus Christ, wholly and completely. And until they do, in every way. We will continue to come to this time of year and look back on the year that has gone before us, feeling that we made progress toward the kingdom, but it will remain not yet here. And we can continue to tell ourselves that we will get there next year we can look to our brothers and sisters and we can say next year in Zion, next year in the kingdom, but until our lives and our hearts are filled with and show forth as Jesus Christ, the conditions won't be there. There's a story that I've always liked that illustrates a 
illustrates the way that we deal with each other and the effect that it has on us and on those around us. And teaches a lesson, I think, in a, in a very simple and easy to, to understand way. There was, there was a house where a family lived. It was kept up very nice. The, the yard looked perfect and green. And around the house, there was one of those just beautiful white picket fences that was, that was perfectly installed. Everything was straight and upright, went all the way around the yard had the, the little gate at the front to walk out to where the street and the mailbox were. And inside was a young family. They had a young boy who had a very bad temper. He got angry said things he probably shouldn't. And in that anger and that temper became a problem within the family. It became a problem uh, for, for them to deal with. So one day the father sat down and talked to his son and gave him a bag of nails and a hammer. And he told them, told him that every time that he lost his temper, that he got angry, that he said something he didn't really mean, that he hurt others around him, he had to go outside and hammer a nail into the back of the fence. The first day after that conversation, the young boy had driven 37 nails into the fence. And then as the days grew on, drew on, over the next few weeks, he learned to control his anger and the number of nails that he had to go out and hammer into the back of that fence, gradually dwindled down and became less and less. Eventually, the day came that he discovered that it was easier to hold his temper than it was to go outside and drive a nail into the fence. And finally, the day came when the boy didn't lose his temper at all. He went and told his father about it and said, very excited that today he didn't have to go outside and put one nail in that fence. So now the father had another suggestion for him. And for each day that he was able to, to do the same, that he was able to hold his temper to not be angry with someone else to not say things that he didn't mean. For each day that he did that, he, he could go outside and he could pull out one nail out of the back of that fence. And the days passed and the months passed. And finally there came the day when the last nail was pulled out. And now the young boy was able to go tell his father that all the nails were gone. So the father took his son by the hand and they went outside and walked up to the fence he said, you've done very well, my son. But look at the holes in the fence. The 
defense will never be the same. You were able to come out, put these nails in the back of the fence and take them back out again. But the holes are still there. And when you say things in anger, even if you take them back, they still leave a scar, just like all the little holes in the fence. young boy learned a lesson that was a very long time in the making in that moment. He learned the importance of carrying himself and his conversation, carrying his interaction with his brothers and sisters, with his family members, with those around him in a way that showed forth not his own frustration or opinion, but showed forth the love that Christ has given him and that he should share with those around him. I want to talk about talk about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to talk about his life, some of the things that he, he did, and some of the things that we can see in those interactions. Because Because it's his love and it's his light and it's his life that we have to take into and share as a part of our own. And I want to talk uh, specifically about about anger and forgiveness, about offense. I want to go first to the book of Matthew, the 18th chapter. starting at the 21st verse. And it's a short interaction that we all know. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus said unto him, I say unto, not unto thee until seven times, but until 70 times seven. Peter, I think, one, was frustrated with his brother in that interaction, but two, thought he was being very magnanimous and giving a great service in his willingness, in his, 
his gift to forgive his brother seven times. But Jesus did what he often did, demonstrated that our understanding and our offering is not completely to the level that is required of us. And he said, not seven times, but 70 times seven. Now that's 490. I would suggest to you that 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 scripture verse doesn't mean that you should forgive somebody 490 times and on the 491st, that would be the straw that breaks the camel's back and that's it. I would also suggest to you that if you are counting to 490, that you are probably not carrying forgiveness in your heart. But that's actually, even that is not as far as Christ calls us to in our love and our forgiveness to our, our brothers and our fellow man. In the Lord's Prayer in the sixth chapter of Matthew, we all know what this says is the Lord was telling us how to pray. This is how he says it, asking the Lord and forgive us our trespasses. as we forgive those who trespass against us. Here Christ is connecting the forgiveness that we are asking our Heavenly Father for the times that we fall short, the times that we sin, the times that we're not as everything that we are supposed to be. And he's tying that to our forgiveness of those who have done so to us. And that just as we ask God to love us and forgive us, even though we fall short, we must do the same to all those who trespass against us. But that too is not all that Christ asks of us. We go to the 22nd chapter of Matthew. In a scripture that uh, Madison read to us, and another one that we're all familiar with. the two great commandments. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So beyond being willing to be magnanimous and forgive, beyond needing to forgive as we ask God to forgive us. Jesus is telling us that we are required to love our neighbors, to love our brothers and sisters, to love those that we come in contact with as ourselves. that requires a greater care and a greater forgiveness and a greater grace given to those than in the verses that we just talked about. But even this, we 
we can look at this requirement that we are to love our neighbors as ourselves, and we can still find limitations or place limitations on that. We can say that self-sacrifice would not be included within that. Giving up something of oneself to help or forgive or save a neighbor would not be included in that because that wouldn't be loving them as you do yourself. It would in fact be denying the care for yourself. But that also is not as far as God asked us to go. In the 13th chapter of the book of John, the 34th verse. This is what Christ told his disciples. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye love one another. And this goes back to where we started. Our call to let our lives be Christ in us and not our own. Jesus was sitting around his disciples in this moment. He had just got through washing all of their feet. He had been walking with them for, for three years. And he was to leave that room. To walk to the garden spend some time, a few more moments in prayer and in fellowship with them before he would be taken, he would be betrayed, taken away in chains. To be tried and to be crucified to save them. Not because chance or circumstance dictated that that had to happen to him, but because he chose to let it happen. And that's the, that is the Savior, and that is the, the life that said unto his disciples at that time and says unto us, a new commandment I give unto you, that ye live one another as I have loved you. that your lives and your relationships, your homes, your churches, your hands and your feet need to be mine. And they need to share the love that Christ has and had when he sacrificed everything to save you and I, even in the moments before we had even turned to him. He made that decision to come and to die for us, to endure the pain of the cross, to live life as a man here on this earth as an example for us to save me. 
to save you in the middle of our unworthiness, in the middle of our unrepentance, in the middle of our choices that would take us away from him. He knew all those things. He knew that if, that if he didn't come to save us, that we would be lost forever, that our desires and our choices would take us far away from anything that had to do with his path and that we would be lost. He knew that we had done and would be able to do nothing to deserve that gift or the sacrifice that he was going to make. And that's when he decided to come and give his life for us. And that's the love that he asks us to have in a new commandment, in our life, in our lives together, and in our lives with the world around us. Brothers and sisters, that's not an easy thing. It's just a few short words, but it includes, but it includes everything in terms of what we are asked and required to give up in our lives. We are asked to let this life be not our own anymore. But answer the door when Christ is knocking to us and let him come in and make our lives his, not ours. Make everything we do his and not ours. We're asked to take the same path that he took carrying the cross up the hill and allowing in that place and in that moment him to take away everything in our lives that is us, that is less than the high calling that he has given to us. and to let ourselves be resurrected anew as a new creature in Christ, and to let our lives be his. And to go forward from that experience and that process in our lives, carrying the love and the grace and the forgiveness and the sacrifice that were his and to letting them show forward in our lives so that truly today and in this moment and in this day and time Jesus Christ can be active and moving in the in in this world that his hands and his feet can be touching the lives of those in this world and that it can do that through ours. In the 12th chapter of Romans, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, 
that you may prove what the good and acceptable and perfect will of God is. So let your whole lives, every moment, be that living sacrifice. Let everything that we do and say be his word and his message to the world around us and to our brothers and our sisters. And if we do that, brothers and sisters, we will be able to prove what that good and acceptable and perfect will of God is. And our lives and our communities will be able to shine forth as Zion the redeemed of the Lord. And we will be able to come together in another time, hopefully not too far distant from now, and be able to look back on the year that has passed and say that that has been accomplished. We will be able to sit in that city, literally built, and sitting on a hill, shining forth its light to all the world. And we will be able to sit in that moment under the ministry and the love of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, not just in words on a page or in what somebody stands up here and says, but in actual presence. We will be able to be there with him in that moment. And my friends, that is an invitation to us all. To meet the Savior that is in our books and the stories that we read. To meet him personally and for real. And to allow him into our lives so that we might be his children in truth. And his light before all the world in everything that we do. I ask the Lord's continued blessings on each one of us as we uh, go forward from this place. As we seek our Lord's will and we seek to, to live out his love in our lives. Let's all open our hymns now to uh, 386. God will take care of us and we'll stand for this and then Elder Dennis Patterson will give us the benediction.
Heavenly Father, as we pause now at the end of this service, we thank you for the words that we have received this day, the way that they were presented, the light that was shined upon those words, that we might have even gained a new perspective. Lord, we love you and we thank you. We recognize the many blessings that you poured out upon us your mercy, your grace, your forgiveness, and even the strength for us to continue on each day. Lord, we would ask that uh, these words might be written in our hearts, that we might always remember to have place in our heart for your spirit, that people might see Jesus in our actions, and that we might truly become that city on a hill, that ensign for this world that so much needs your love and your mercy and your laws and your direction. Please bless us, and I would have now pronounce a benediction in the name of your blessed Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you.